Until 15 years ago, the Kremlin was the seat of power of the Soviet Union and locked in Cold War with the West. What a difference today. An elected president, Vladimir Putin, trying to bring Russia into the free market. But the strains are beginning to tell. The huge gap still between rich and poor and the loss of some of the freedoms that were won when communism fell. But Russia has made it to membership of the G8, the rich man's club, and this year for the first time is holding the presidency. So we've come here to Moscow to debate the future of Russia, its place in the world, the great changes that are going on here, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which Putin himself once described as one of the great catastrophes of the 20th century. On question time from Moscow, Grigory Karasin, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, Douglas Alexander, British Foreign Office Minister, Andrei Ilyaranov, uh, Chief Economic Advisor to President Putin, till he resigned at the end of last year, Natalia Norichnitskaya, uh, the Russian Member of Parliament, Igor Jurgens, Vice President of the Russian Union of Industrialists, and Garry Kasparov, former World Chess Champion, Leader of the United Civil Front of Russia. Well, good evening from the Ostankino studios. In addition to this programme of Question Time, which is going to be shown not just in Britain, but all over the world on BBC World. Our audience here tonight made up of Russian speakers, some people, foreigners living in this country as well, but all of them, of course, speaking English one way or the other. Our panel, as ever, I don't know the questions that are going to be put to them. And wherever you're watching, you can comment on what they say. Just go to bbc.co.uk forward slash question time. If you're watching in the United Kingdom, you can also text us, 83981, the usual number to text us, CFAX, page 155, to read what others are saying. Our first question tonight from Stuart Bowler, please. Thank you. Do you believe that Russia should use its UN veto to prevent sanctions being imposed upon Iran? Andre. No. <laughs> um, I think it's a very serious issue and maybe one of the most important issues on um, international agenda today. Um, it is very clear um, the uh, Iranian authorities have uh, declared that they're going to acquire nuclear weaponry and they also declared how they're going to use this nuclear weaponry. So it is in the interest of all humanity and certainly of Russia, first of all, much more than Britain, uh, not to allow it to happen because uh, Russia is much closer to Iran rather than Britain. Okay. Uh, if, if, I may, if I may add a few words to that, I think, uh, importantly, uh, Russia works together with the European Troika, United States and China, uh, for a much more predictable way, uh, understood by the in international community, uh, uh, you know that yesterday there was a special statement of the uh, General Secretary of, uh, of UN on that issue and uh, uh, I hope that MAGATE, being a specialized UN organization, will keep a close eye on that so it is in, in good hands, professional hands, and nobody is substituting anyone in that, in that but, but very do you, important... But to answer the question, do you think Russia should use a UN veto if it comes to it to prevent sanctions? Well, we have the right, but, but I, would, I, would, I would think of uh, in a much... Uh, how should I say? I would prefer it never happens. We, we should, we should, we should uh, work for a much more comfortable uh, situation on that question. But uh, nevertheless, if sanctions and other countries have talked about them, are proposed, would Russia be against them? I hate hypothetic conversations of that sort. <laughs> of course you, know, you do. Diplomats <laughs> never say no. They, they always Natalia. try. Well, uh, I strongly believe that Russia should do its best uh, not to let that issue to go so far as this veto is needed. But I certainly would not like also uh, Iran to become a protectorate of the United States, as Iraq already has become. Uh, because it's too close <laughs> to Russia. Uh, that, uh, but also I agree with uh, the views already expressed that uh, Iran's 
acquisition of nuclear weapons is contrary to Russian interest, and that is the common footing with the West. Okay. Douglas Alexander. Well, I welcome the fact that Russia has been working so closely with the United Kingdom and the other members of the Security Council because we have a common strategic objective, and that's to stop Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. Of course, it's a neighbor of Russia, but it's of concern to all of us. Uh, we had, of course, a meeting today in Berlin of our foreign ministers of Russia and the United Kingdom, along with those of Germany, France, and the United States. And I welcome the unanimity there's been from the international community. Because if I believe anything is going to be effective in the face of Iran who are in breach of their international obligations, it is the international community working together. We will have a further report both to the IAEA and also to the Security Council in 30 days' time. And 30 days from now, are sanctions a possibility from Britain's point of view or are they out of the question? We've agreed with our other partners the way forward would be graduated measures. We've reported the matter to the Security Council. The report in 30 days will both go to the International Atomic Energy Authority and also to the Security Council. Of course, there are other measures that can be si considered, but I certainly agree with the earlier panelists that I hope that in the intervening 30 days, Iran chooses a different course and finds itself back in adherence with its right. international obligations. Well, Stuart Bowler, who asked the question, what do you think of the uh, answers you've had so far? Mr. Bowler. I, I agree with the answers, basically. They, obviously, we need to avoid getting to the point, but I think a worse catastrophe would be uh, imposing sanctions on Iran and allowing those sanctions at a later time to be used in the same way that sanctions were used against Iraq. Do you think that uh, United States and Britain, despite what Mr. Alexander says, have that in mind? I'm very suspicious that that's the uh, long-term objective. Okay. Gary Kasparov. Uh, so first of all, we understand that if not for Russian technology, we wouldn't be discussing this problem at all. Uh, two is uh, the reason Russia never stopped doing it because now the company which supplies Iran with nuclear technology is, is owned by people close to Mr. Putin. Three, it's very clear, and I, I heard it in another classical case of self-deception, which we all know from mid-30s in relation to, to, to Nazi Germany, when uh, UK, US, France, or other Western countries are thinking that we're working in a concert. Putin's interest is very simple. He needs high oil prices. That's it. That's the only one item in the agenda. If the prices go down, his regime will collapse. Tension in the Middle East is good. Of course, Iran acquiring nuclear weapons could be potentially dangerous, but the, and I agree with Natalia Narochinska that is contrary to Russian interests. But it's a long-term problem which Mr. Putin doesn't care of today. Mm -hmm. Igor Yovins. Number one, we were interested in all kind of deals with Iran as entrepreneurs and industrialists, and we had that chance. Number two, we were discussing with our Western colleagues if there is a compensation deal, we wouldn't be bothered by all those nuclear sites, but you guys in the West turned us down, and that was a couple of years ago. So the, the whole case could have been uh, much better solved if business people would be given this task. I disagree that... Uh, we should be using uh, our uh, veto, no way. I think that if they renege on their obligations, we should uh, impose sanctions. But I agree 100% with the gentleman who asked the question, that if that turns out to be a smokescreen for further intervention, that's a catastrophe for us. D do you believe that President Putin would use a veto at the UN? You say you don't want to see one used. Do you believe it would be used? No. I don't believe You don't? So. Okay. No. You, sir, in the front here. They cheated on us already. I mean, Iranians. The Iranians cheated. I don't remember this debate when Israel gained nuclear weapons, India gained nuclear weapons, Pakistan gained nuclear weapons. So why are we having this debate now? I hear a very serious difference because neither India nor Pakistan nor Israel has ever declared its readiness uh, to use this nuclear weaponry against any particular oh, country, on, unlike, unlike in, in the case of Iran. And here we're actually facing a much more serious problem uh, that actually is closing, um, and the time does work against the world community. Because since deployment of the Russian missile store in Iran, it actually would trigger Israeli response almost immediately, or before these missiles will be deployed on the Iranian territory okay. around the nuclear site. I, I so that mean, is why it I makes the uh, conflict in the Middle East almost unavoidable. The, the woman on the right. a very right. serious issue, much more serious than we're discussing right, right. now. Okay. <laughs> Brief point to you, and then we'll move on. 
I think Russia should put veto because sanction never sanction against government. It's always sanctions against people. That's what I think. So it, wouldn't w it, it would only hurt the people of Iran and not the government? Well, we've seen what happened. And anyway, the U.S. can continue with veto or without. The, as we know, the Security uh, Council did not, uh, Council of Security, he did not give a permission to start Iraqi procedure. Okay. Let's move on to another question. We've got a lot of questions tonight. We'll Ooh. come to you in a moment. Anton Grishanov, please. Yes. How does the situation with uh, human rights and freedom of speech in uh, Russia deal with the Russian presidency in uh, G8? Thank you. Gary Kasparov. Well, I think that uh, using the word G8, we should understand it's a total mockery because G7 stands for seven great industrial democracies. Set aside, you know, the Russian industrial power, Russia doesn't qualify to be democracy by norm normal accepted standards. And we all know that Russian in in inclusion or um, in, in uh, uh, this club under Yeltsin was sort of an, an advance payment. And it's very clear that since Mr. Putin had a very steady record of ruining all democratic institutions in Russia, today the fact that this, this summit takes place in, uh, in St. Petersburg just shows inability of the leaders of G7 to protect the values of the club. Okay. Um, Grigory Karasin, yes. Let me just repeat the question. How does the situation with human rights and freedom of speech in Russia sit with its presidency of the G8? Well, I, I think, first of all, that our today's panel, which is, which is in Moscow, is a good illustration of how things are in, in Moscow and the Russian Federation generally. I, I, I do not believe that we have no... I, I'm not as categoric as Gary uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the country we live in, about the regime we have, about the government and the president. I, uh, I am a proponent of not revolutionary, but, but evolutionary matters. And I think that we, uh, we should be less categoric because uh, otherwise there would be a division of the society. Uh, uh, I think that we, we are coming to the stage where our politics and our economics and our industrialists are becoming more and more, uh, how should I say, responsible uh, uh, for the society. So we are on the right track. Of course, there are quite a number of problems. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, you, you can't read newspapers because there is no substance in them, for example, and that is my fresh uh, impression on many uh, uh, publications which we have in Moscow, it's not a matter for lack of liberty or lack of freedom of speech. So when, when, when senior American senators like John McCain, Republican senator, talks about an assault on democracy and political freedom, and once Russia suspended from the G8, how do you react to that? Well, I think we can't stop any senator expressing his views. No. Uh, th <laughs> this is also a, a very good reason, but not necessarily you we have... You can't stop a Russian opposition to express views on Russian television. No. That's, you succeeded. No, no. Well, I think... No, no, I do not agree with that. Uh, we, we should be more positive in our agenda, I think. We should Let's be more positive. Let's have on Russian television. Let's, let's talk on Russian television, not on BBC. But we do uh, talk on... No, we're not talking about... No, 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 no. Why not Natalia. we are now on, on something that will, will uh, not be shown in Russia? Of True. I think Natalia. Fr from the Western point of view, there is no democracy now in Russia, probably because we do not shoot parliaments anymore. So, um, <laughs> we heard only applause when it happened in uh, 1993. And many of our uh, opposition... Uh, groups and uh, sectors of society were ousted from political life uh, during uh, the whole 90s. I was one of them. What do you think now of the current state of, uh, of human rights and freedom uh, of speech? I think... Do you take uh, the point that Gary was oh, making? I'm, you know that I'm uh, head of parliamentary commission for the study of the observance of human rights in foreign countries. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way... Um, so? You know, the faults of any political system can be of two natures. One has to do with the f f faults of legislation. Another type of faults has to do with cultural, political, historical background, cultural context with law enforcement. In this field, we have some problems, but certainly we can't say that there are no human <coughs> rights observance okay. in Russia. Although uh, we have right. to go a long way Ahead. Okay. Andre, I'll come, to, I'll come to the lady in the back there. Andre first. Uh, freedom of speech is uh, one of the basic human rights. It's also ability to speak and ability to be heard. 
And here's a slight difference between Grigori and Natalia on one side and Gary on the other side. Just before the show, I asked all of them when they were last time on the live Russian TV. Natalia was 10 days ago, Grigori was 10 days, 10 days ago, and Gary was two and a half years ago. It's two and a half years ago? Two and a half years ago. Yeah. And they actually the leader of the party, Motherland Party, that Natalia belongs to, Mr. Rogozin, who is very well known in Russia, who was forced to resign a few days ago, last time was on the Russian television a year ago. That's actually the very clear uh, sign what is the level of freedom of speech for different people in the but country. That's and, 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 and sorry, uh, hold on, hold on, Natalia. No, Natalia, you've, no, you've spoken twice. Less than a year no, Natalia, ago, you've spoken twice. I've got other members of the panel to bring in, I must bring them in. But just before I do, uh, the question of the presidency of the G8, Andre, do you think that is a leg legitimate question to raise, as the Americans have, of kicking Russia out of the G8? Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, in terms of political freedom uh, and as uh, democratic uh, values, uh, G7 and Russia are oceans apart. Uh, unlike G7, that all politically free countries, uh, Russia is a country with non-free status for the last year. And Russia actually one of two countries in Europe that happen to have non-free countries. The other one is Belarus. Okay. The, the, the woman at the back there. No. Uh, you, no, man, sorry. Oh. I sometimes get them muddled. And, yes. Yes. and actually, yes. fa fa no, thing, fa far actually, away. I have seen a lot of Mr. Kasparov on television lately, so I would like to ask him a question. What do you call advance of democracy in the time, in the epoch of Yeltsin? The, is it that most Russians have been reduced to poverty? Is it that their uh, dignity and most of them are humiliated? Is it that advance in democracy uh, and... Uh, why do you call any step forward just a step aside from democracy? Okay. I mean, excuse me, what do you mean step forward? Step uh, forward? Step forward. You mean Putin made steps forward? Yes. Yes. Indeed. Okay. Uh, now, obviously, Yeltsin ruled the country uh, in, in, in the transition period, and uh, we couldn't call Russia a you know, fully democratic state under Yeltsin's time. But the parliament nearly impeached Yeltsin. The parliament was controlled by the opposition parties. And uh, um, if you compare you know, the, the situation with the freedom of press and ability of Russian people to recognize the wrongdoings of the government in 95, 96, 99, or, or today, you, you could find a lot of differences. Okay. But for it, six it, don't you right, think uh, that yeah, but this no, no, hold on, when, hold on. When, when, when did you, you last travel across Russia? Let, I want to bring other people in because I've got a panel here waiting to speak. Yeah. Igor? Russia is not a classical democracy, that's for sure. It would be very difficult to think that after all these years will be classical democracy. But Russia is a free country. I'm 53, I never had it so free. I can go abroad, I can talk, I can be this and this. I can be severely beaten up by my own government, which was the Yukos case in my particular case. But I'm absolutely determined that Russia should be engaged with G8, should be a member of G8, should work hard, and it will depend largely on Gary and Natalia. Are we democracy or not democracy? If Gary brings out a million people tomorrow out, if, if he can do that, I would applaud. If Natalia brings out two million people out, as left and right here, I would applaud. But it's up to them, it's up to Russian people, but Russia as a state should be engaged and should be a member of G8. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Russia is definitely not a democracy, uh, but it, that's not the question. If Russia is excluded from the G8, it is going to be a catastrophe, for, not for Russia, but for the world. Because we have a lot of very conservative people in our uh, parliament, in our government, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of generals that still see America as the main enemy of uh, free world. So if Russia is excluded from uh, G8, uh, the frames uh, will be destroyed, so and Russia will become uh, a um, military uh, country that will uh, try to explain what to the rest of the world. Okay. Hold on, Douglas Alexander. What a passion, Douglas Alexander. Could I? Yes, you can. But after sorry. Douglas Alexander. Sorry, David. I know there are people <laughs> both on this panel and in this audience this evening and right across Russia who have very genuine concerns that Russia is moving backwards, not forwards, in relation to human rights and democratic values. But that begs a very fundamental question, a question that was anticipated by the audience member. What is the right response in the face of those concerns to the issue of the G8 chairmanship? I think it would be wrong for Russia and wrong for the G8 to follow the lead suggested by Senator McCain and Senator Biden in the United States. And let me explain why. 
I believe that for those who do want to see a strong and vibrant democracy within Russia, then the very experience of having the G8 visiting Russia, the kind of program that we see this evening, is important as an opportunity for Russia to uphold the best democratic <coughs> values. But equally from the G8 <coughs> point of view, not only is it in our interests to make sure that there is a flourishing democracy here within Russia, but if you look at the kind of issues that the G8 now addresses more than 30 years after it was established, last year under our chairmanship, fundamental issue of climate change. This year under the Russian chairmanship, the fundamental issue of energy security. Who, when looking at the world today, believes that the G8 would be more effective at dealing in climate change or indeed energy security if we now arbitrarily suspended Russia? I simply do not agree it would be in Russia's interest or in the wider interests of the G8. By the way, may I... Do you, do, you believe, do, you believe that Russia, do you believe that Russia does have problems with human rights and freedom of speech that are an issue? Well, those well, concerns are put very clearly to me by Russian citizens who I've met on my right. visits to Russia, and I've in turn passed those on directly to the Russian government. Grigory Karasin. But do you know... Uh, I think that if we, if we simply imagine that uh, since July 91, when Mikhail Gorbachev was first uh, uh, invited to the uh, G7 fringes in London, uh, uh, only 15 years is the distance. We would understand how important those international activities are within the frames of the G8. For Russia, it is, it is uh, the chairmanship of G8 it is a very good university for, for many for, for many respects. First of all, the, the priorities are really very important. That is the uh, energy, security, diseases, uh, and education. We follow up the, the uh, British chairmanship in many respects and the problems. So ni about 90 events which are planned within the frames uh, uh, of uh, uh, chairmanship here in Moscow with the sous Sherpas, Sherpas, experts in different uh, uh, ways, uh, stratas of life, is really a very important contribution, not only to Russia and its experience, but to the international interaction in those... So, so the world, the G8 should turn a blind eye to the human rights abuses that Amnesty well, and others I have identified. If you, name me, them? If, you, if you name me the ideal country where all the, the rights uh, of the, uh, are observed, uh, I will thank you for that. Uh, so, sorry, so you, so you, mean, uh, you, mean in the, in the, sorry, you mean in the G7 there are countries that have the kind of uh, abuse of human rights that Amnesty well, International claims apply no, in no. Russia? If, if uh, we're talking if about the G8, yes, if you take Yes, if you take the events in France, for example, you will understand that not everything is ideal there. I mean, you compare and France to Beslan? I know. Uh, so, so, and when people try to, 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 to uh, target... Uh, uh, let's say the, the uh, specific country like Belarus, saying that that is the last tyranny of Europe. Is it a good service for this country, or, or this is or this is a cornering of the country, which is close to Russia, uh, which is which is actually uh, uh, trying to, to to vote for its own president? After all, Belarusians voted for for Belarusian president. Okay. Eighty eighty two percent. Eighty two percent versus 6 percent. No, that's, that, that's, that's, that's what is expected in Russia because that's a position of Russian government. That's what you want to yes. see in our country. No, no. no, no well, well, this is a different. Russia was ready for victory not because of the fraud. Uh, everyone knows that the everyone no, that, that was the reason for no. hysteria because they knew no. that in general Belarusian people are indifferent to the Western ideological stock in, chain, in change. So, so they are not westernized spiritually. No. They say, okay. we couldn't care Let less about your freedoms. We like the way we have. May I quote United Nations Charter, Chapter 1, Goals and Principles? Not no in one, soul, no, no, of <laughs> course. You know, when we started studying English language, we uh, were supposed to learn uh, the United Nations Charter by heart in the third year of institute, so I still remember. Let's just have the quote. Yes, the quote. Uh, if you search uh, the word democracy in the chapter named goals and principles, you won't find at okay. all what is stated there, sovereign equality of all actors of international behavior, which means that monarchy and republic, a democratic, secular, liberal state, and, for instance, religious state, are equal from the point of view of international law, all and right. there is no 
relation between them as between progressive and backward. Natalia, thank you very much. And lower. Thank you. So uh, the, the man there in the, in the, in the grey shirt, you sir, we hear from one or two members of our, of our audience. Okay, without sir. passing any comment on Russian democracy, I, I would say that the uh, Guantanamo Bay situation would demonstrate that the US still has some lessons to learn in terms of democracy and human rights. And you, sir. <laughs> Well, uh, I do believe that for practical reasons, uh, uh, Western countries should incorporate Russia as much as possible into economic structure of the, of the world. And if you look back at the Russian past, every time when uh, a relationship between West and, uh, and Soviet Union were better, it definitely had much better reflection on democracy situation in the Soviet Union than when Russia was completely isolated. And m another point which I'd like to make very, very briefly, that I think the very alarming thing is that uh, Russia really uh, is turning into corporate state. The, the theme which, which uh, we can find in uh, um, Andrei Larion publications, and that, that's really very dangerous. So the level of democracy seems to be really going down somehow. And, and there are a lot of things which are, a lot of rules which are applied very differently. And the, the, there are us and theirs. And, 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 and the country turns into something like really uh, with a small number of shareholders uh, leaving the rest of the population in disadvantage. Okay. Thank you very much. And <laughs> the woman up there in pink. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, you should uh, take into consideration the historical background of Russia. When our first parliament took place in 1905, and then uh, in several years, very short, communists came. So, and then now we have parliament for how many years? I mean, we don't have so much um, experience in having democracy. And now when the political elite will change and we, new generation, will come with knowing the Western best features we have and Eastern best features, and then the we will create a uh, new, new Russia with new national idea. I mean, it's no is it, use is it, your, is it your opinion, because you've heard what was said here, is it your opinion that in terms of democracy, Russia is moving forwards or backwards? I think it's moving forward because... Uh, we can be just, we are in between East and West, and we have Eastern peculiarities and Western, right. and we have to have our own way and not just be copying the Western countries. Okay, uh, Andre, <coughs> we'll comment on that. Uh, I'd like to pick up uh, the question that have been, have been posed by these gentlemen in the front row, um, as G8 as a way how to teach other countries to do democracy. It's exactly what you have suggested. So that is why I would suggest that other uh, leaders, let's say, of Iran, Belarus, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, should be invited to G8, just to also to be, to be taught uh, as a democracy. As a, person, uh, as a person, actually, who was dealing a little bit with G8, being as a Russian Sherpa for more than five years, I have to tell you, G8 is not a school class to teach somebody something. It is another organization. It's an organization to work together. It's an organization for those who do share values and principles. And it's not the way to teach one member what to do and what not to do. Each statement of G8 leaders each year starts with the phrase, we are the leaders of industrialized democracies of the world. If you just look at any international standards on any international publications and international criteria. Russia does not fit Did these criteria. And that is why we have to ask ourselves, and this is a very great philosophical question, it's actually an issue for all of us, what kind of country we would like to see Russia? Russia is a very big, or Russia as free country? And strong Russia could be only free. Non-free Russia cannot be strong. It's just, it's very clear. Did you, did you, um <laughs> Did you, did, you, did you make these points to President Putin when you were his senior economic advisor until the end of last year? Did I you say all this to him? I have a very strict rule for myself. I never discuss publicly what I did discuss with my former boss. Okay. <laughs> the, woman, the woman at the back, yeah. So, uh, what are the prospects of G8 in the context of the future world order? Thank you very much. What are the prospects for... Yeah. The, con the future uh, what are world the order. Yeah, prospects of G8 in the context of the future All right. world order. Douglas Alexander, you tried that one because you've been silent for a bit. Well, the G8 was established in 1975, immediately after the oil shock of the 70s. The first real challenge it faced was the issue of how do you have sustained economic growth in circumstances of insecurity of oil supplies. Almost 30 years on, we're facing 
a very similar challenge. And I think the G8 can make a contribution, not just here in Russia, but to those global challenges that we do face, whether climate change, as we focused on last year, international development. I welcome, frankly, the fact that Russia has written off the Soviet Union's debt to a large portion of African countries as a direct consequence of its membership of the G8 last year. So I do think there are real opportunities. But I also think, frankly, this meeting that will take place in St. Petersburg in July is a huge test for Russia. Will we see a commitment, for example, to genuinely open, transparent, liberalized energy markets, which would be a significant step forwards towards energy security? Would they, for example, choose to ratify the Energy Charter Treaty, which up until now they've only signed but not ratified? I think there are real tests that can be set for Russia. But in answer to some of the other points on the panel, I do ask what I think is a pretty fundamental question. Are we more likely to see a strong and healthy democracy by urging Russia to turn inwards or to turn outwards? I am categorically convinced that the right response, not just for the G8 and indeed for the challenges the world faces, but the challenges for Russia, is to ensure that we further integrate them into those global international structures as a means of securing democracy here within Russia. Okay, and the last point from you, sir. Oh, just a comment, you. please, not uh, a question, if you will. Well, I just wanted to comment to comment on the statement that Russia doesn't fit uh, the requirements of the G8. So yeah. I just wanted to say that in this case we should accept also that uh, some other countries which are in the G8 now, so they actually doesn't uh, meet all the requirements. For example, uh, I'm not going to talk about the democracy, but if we take, for example, the provision of law in the United States of America that uh, in case uh, when the, uh, for example, airplane is being captured by the terrorists, it is allowed to destroy this airplane in order to prevent from uh, maybe other disasters. But I don't think that... Uh, is it the law in America? So actually, yes. And uh, as far as I is know... Is it the law in America? It's a law in Russia. Just, you know, it's no, a passed in by Russia. Russian we are going to uh, no, make such a law in Russia. It's not the law in America. That it's you can destroy a plane that has been hijacked. Yes. It's, it's a law by, by passed by the I'm Congress. I'm not mistaken, so... Uh, I think the, yeah, he's right. The American president can order no, no, uh, the destruction of Russia, the plane that Russia, has been hijacked. In Russia, it's a law passed by the parliament. Okay. Yeah, right. that's, that's a fundamental difference. Well, it's I a law versus presidential ability to do it. All right. It. I'm going to move on. Thank you, anyway, for the point. And uh, I'm sorry we didn't take that very much further. But let's take a question now from George Cunningham. George, George Cunningham, please. Mr. Cunningham. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. The NGO Rocks is buying Saga a fair farcical to the ordinary person. Is there still such distrust between the two countries that we still have to play these clock and dagger games? This was a um, strange story of the Rocks that had uh, receivers and transmitters and people wandering past them apparently either picking up or giving messages. Indeed, Mr. Alexander would be, I would like his... Well, I'm sure Mr. Alexander is ready to answer, but I'm going to ask Grigori, first of all. Um, <laughs> well, uh, do we still have to play these cloak and gag dagger games? Well, fortunately, uh, I left as ambassador to the court of St. James before that story. <laughs> so uh, I'm not actually in the depth of details of that, but it seems to me that we actually, we uh, passed the period when, when we were... Uh, playing games uh, uh, with Britain, uh, you know, in, in shadowy businesses. Uh, we are on the right track now, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, you know, people uh, uh, being diplomats in others' country do, do not have to obey the uh, rules and, and the diplomatic practices. So it seems to me that if something is being proved, and if, uh, that is why, by the way, if we, if we take the NGOs, uh, why it is necessary for, for the society like Russia to, to try and put that in order, you know, to have, to have the system of, uh, I mean, what is NGOs, what are their rights? We've never had experience or pattern uh, dealing with NGOs in our own country uh, or dealing with NGOs in other countries. So, so uh, it is absolutely uh, uh, natural that the government tries to put its house, I mean the Russian house, in order and to understand the rules. I, I do agree with some of my uh, uh, counterparts uh, uh, today when we meet that the, the most important thing now is implementation of that, of that legislation. 
which has been, by the Sorry, way, done. Sorry, you may be losing viewers in Britain. What do you actually yeah, mean by this? You don't back. think there should be non-governmental organizations no, no, in, in no, Russia there, there, there looking at be. human there rights are, and things? There are thousands of them already, yes. but, but the not, not many people in Russia understand how they operate. And we have to teach ourselves, uh, with, the, with the patterns already existing in the international society, what are the rules? What, what, what are the practices? What should be the financial operations between our NGOs and the NGOs and governments outside Russia? Uh, the, the questions are very practical. There is nothing terrible in those questions. But from time to time, you know, uh, uh, you know we have to answer. Them. Okay. Well, uh, Douglas Alexander, perhaps you could throw some light on what on earth was going on. I fear not, uh, not least for the fact that no British minister would ever, I'm sure you wouldn't really expect any British government minister to uh, answer allegations of espionage. What I can tell you... Well, I'd enjoy it. Well, what I, can, uh, yes. <laughs> what I can tell you, David, is we make no apology for the work that we do undertake with NGOs here within Russia. When I visited Russia last month, I visited Nizhny Novgorod, one of the major provincial cities, and saw the work of NGOs dealing with... Uh, HIV AIDS sufferers. That's an NGO supported by the British Embassy here in Moscow and I think that's vital work. It speaks to very fundamental challenges that we can only address together in the international community today, whether it's HIV AIDS, which will be one of the issues touched on at the G8 summit. I've already mentioned climate change. So we are in a very different world from where we were 15 years ago. There are common challenges and I believe we're best working together to meet them. And do, do you think these, um, these apparent, um, these rocks in the park, are they a kind of red herring? <laughs> uh, so to speak, to mix the metaphor, that, uh, that, has, been, that has been drawn... Uh, that, uh, well, were they anything to do with the NGOs, or were they something different? No, they weren't anything to do with the NGOs, but tempting though your second bite at the cherry is, uh, in terms of the question, you really wouldn't expect me to deal with specific allegations. What I can tell Well, they you must have been to do with something, presumably. Well, <laughs> what I can tell you is that we make no apology for the work that the British Embassy does here in Moscow, supporting NGOs, and I'll tell you why, right. because we believe NGOs... No, we heard that answer already. It's the other answer we were interested in. ...have a huge contribution to make, not just here in Russia, okay. but frankly in all advanced democracies. Okay. Igor, what do you think? Distrust between two countries? Do we have to play cloak and dagger games still? Uh, I was heartened at the way we got over it. You know, the four guys caught, right, even if they co were caught right, red handed, uh, nothing happened, no exchange of spies, nothing of the kind. So I was heartened at the speed with which we get over this crisis. I was appalled at the fact that they tried to tie it up to NGO issue because it's an entirely different issue. I'm a member of this Eurasia, which was accused of being. Uh, a spy organization, we, we were dealing with exactly that. We were dealing with uh, HIV, AIDS, AIDS, with uh, education in the Southern Caucasus and stuff like that. But, but to tell you the whole truth, and that's for the, America, uh, for the British uh, diplomatic corps, one of the guys who was handling grants was obviously caught in this scandal. So obviously there is some professional incompetence. You should divide between those diplomats who spy and those diplomats who do a normal job. Yeah. But <laughs> NGOs are vi of vital importance and we should be very thankful for the West. Mm. And we were begging actually for the help from the West we in 91, 95. Mm. Mm. Now we're sort of proud with all the petrodollars, but let's remember the time when we were asking mm the West to help us out with grants, with everything. Natalia was on the grant from NGO abroad. No. Okay. Yes, she was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, one uh, uh, you uh, know uh, that I'm one of the sp co sponsors of this uh, uh, law on NGOs. Yes. I'm one of the sponsors. Yes. And, uh, you know, the story with this spy story, uh, well, I'm a professional well, not in that sense, of course, <laughs> but, but I'm a professional scholar of international relations. Such stories happen every half year, and usually the foreign ministers settle it, you know, in private. Even in the Cold War, uh, parties were uh, sometimes even agreeing on what uh, force sh um, of hysteria would be allowed in this particular scenario of international conflict, but still, are we entitled to know whether the money accumulated on the account of some three good-hearted men wanting to mend the roof of bitter widows, like in the gospel, you know, uh, whether it's, this money is really spent on that noble purpose, or is it a divided between 
founders of the organization, which is contrary to the law, or is it spent on buying printing machinery for uh, political right. uh, propaganda, or buying weapons is for undergrad, yeah, etc. Et yeah. No, we machines. just know. I said that we are entitled to know how the money is spent uh, right. in America. The legislation is much stronger, okay. in France uh, much stronger. Gary, do you I want to reply? Uh, Natalia, you make your points, but a bit too long, if I might say. Okay, okay, you okay. Just okay. Lose, no, I don't want to comment attention. on American just laws, so I'm not an expert. So for, from what I understand, that's, it's a very different situation. But Now, I think it's, it's quite telling us that the question was about spy scandal. And the first response from governmental officials immediately turned it to NGOs. That's, that's, that's a response, you know. It was not about spies because nobody was sent off. It was just a, they forgot in, in a week when the law passed the parliament and when they were happy that now can they, they can officially, they did it before this, this, this law was pa passed uh, um, the, the parliament, but now they could officially regulate NGOs. That's it. That's, that's the whole purpose. Okay. Like uh, Andre, Andre. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Please, Natalia. Please, 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 please. Andre. Uh, two points uh, first. I do feel very much sorry for Grigori. Grigori is in the, in the worst really? position, hardest position among all of us. Because you're in a position as government official, as I was uh, several months ago, in a position to defend not defendable. So that is why I feel <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> and, second, and second, because we're talking about trust, be, be, trust between two countries and between maybe even more, G8 countries. Douglas. It will be a huge disappointment for you personally and for your colleagues in the British government when you will arrive to G8 summit in St. Petersburg. Because what you are talking about energy security as the main issue for G8 summit. The best way to secure energy security, sorry for that, just is to have free market, private property, access of companies, private companies to pipelines. It's, it's exactly opposite to what is going on here in Russia. Because here, oil companies are being nationalized. There is no way to build private pipelines <laughs> only. And here, the actual proposal by the Russian authorities to have overall regulation of the oil markets. Mm -hmm. It's a way not to security. It's a way to insecurity of, of energy uh, over uh, all over the world and in Russia, too. Andrei, we know to from uh, our experience uh, with uh, other centrally I planned economy. I know, I just so now we are going to propose this idea I want to for general public and for G8. It you will be a huge blow for you, you're, you're G8, you're and answering. for trust between our two okay. countries. When you, I, I, I do want to hear from some members of the audience on this spying point, but you're answering a question which I'm just about to have put. So I'll come back to you on the mm. point about oil and men, but let's just stick with this other point for the moment and take a couple of points from the audience. You, madam. Uh, I just wanted to ask Mr. Karasin why, when you say about uh, the need to regulate NGOs, you imply control banning. The same to Mrs. Narenchitska. Uh, you say that NGOs have to be controlled, their funding has to be controlled. I'm sorry, but they're non-government organizations. And why should government have control over their funding? No. Uh, should, I, should I try to answer as a person uh, uh, whom probably uh, really people try to feel sorry for? Uh, <laughs> Well, I, as, as I said, you know, Russian history never had a, a fixed pattern or tradition in, in developing NGO movements. It happened so that, that I mean, within, let's say, 15 last years, we, we, we uh, have uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of NGOs already in existence. Some of them are uh, really important, useful. Some of them are hopeless because they, you know, use the NGO status for self-profiting, etc. So uh, the idea was simply to, to put that in order, in, in logic, so, so that NGOs understand their own rights, uh, you know, government understands where it is, what, I mean, what, what should be the financial transactions between NGOs and the, 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 uh, you know, the people who donate well, money? Well, she's saying, why bother? It doesn't <laughs> do with so, you at all. So Just it's not a question of banning something. I, yeah, I can tell uh, you that... Let her, let her come back and, uh, and, and pick up the uh, point. When in 1999 the law was passed on re-registration of the NGOs, 
Many NGOs, such as, for example, Salvation Army, were deprived of this registration, and Salvation Army was deprived of this registration because of the word army in it. Well, that, that is an interesting logic, by the way. But, but uh, no, but just but to go to the nub of the point, if it's a non-governmental organization, an NGO, why should government be involved? Very briefly, and then I want to bring in the woman there, and then we want to move on. So if you could just quickly, perhaps you can't. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Explain. To what? Why should government be involved in non-governmental organizations? Well, it was a good idea, no. but again, well, lousy you see, no, like the, the, the Always the in Russia. <laughs> okay. to taxes, and, and you're attacking one of the most liberal vice, vice ministers of foreign affairs in, in, in the history of Russia, by the way. I feel appalled. Okay. Because G G G Grigory is one of the best, so please, don't, don't grill much, him. So there is don't the don't, ask him, don't <laughs> ask him the difficult questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and the woman up there, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. Could someone of the panelists please comment on the recent rumors that were very popular in Russian mass media? The rumors that, well, the government simply used the situation with the Russian, uh, with the spy scandal. They took this accident, exaggerated all the details because no one knows actually what happened, and used it as a cover to restrict the laws concerning NGOs and to make them dependent well, uh, on the that government. Has been, that has been referred to here. But uh, Douglas Alexander, briefly, do you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, was it really exaggerated, uh, this uh, spy scandal, or what happened in, in, well, in oh, general? Of course well, it nobody was. knows. Well, Let's be honest, of course, but it has always no been formal done contact so. from the Russian government on this so issue. There is not, not okay. No, no, what to it. Let me okay. just make one point, ago, okay. Let me just make one point on the end. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. One at a time, please. Let me just very no, uh, one at a time, not two at a time. Douglas, very briefly. Um, this NGO law, which uh, comes into force in just a couple of weeks' time here in Russia, is a matter which, candidly, we have had real concerns about, partly because of the different traditions uh, here in Russia from in other parts of the world, and also because, although there were changes made by the Duma, uh, there are real concerns amongst NGOs operating here in Russia as to the effect. I've heard those concerns directly. Just within the last two weeks, the Open Russia Foundation has had all of its bank accounts seized. So there are continuing concerns about how free this environment is for non-governmental organizations to operate in. Okay. The British government, I can assure you, will continue to take a close interest in it in the months ahead. We're running, so we're, we're running, we're running out of time. About G8 status, no, status no, no. Of, uh, of Russia. Paul, I think it's a really very good, especially from the British side. Paul Pickering, please. Paul Pickering. <laughs> Question from you. It needs a microphone. Helps. Thank you. Mr. Pickering. Good evening. Is uh, Russia Pickering. set to use its energy, energy resources uh, as a basis for recreating uh, superpower status? Energy as a basis for recreating superpower status. Igor Jorgens. Yeah, partly, definitely, we will use our energy as to recreate our superpower status. I, I hope that we will not go as far as we went in the USSR time. But it's only logical to use our energy for the... Uh, how should I say, try to influence our nearest abroad and the whole of the world. But we should be transparent, we should stick to cer certain games, we should be the members of uh, WTO, we should be the members of uh, all international organizations and abide by the rules. So I hope that the discussion which took place on energy security, on the security of demand, on the security of uh, supply, very serious issues being discussed now before the G8 summit. I hope that it will uh, come to pr practical t fruition, mm. and we will be uh, one of the superpowers in terms of energy, but not one of the superpowers imposing ourselves on others. What about the cutting off of gas to the Ukraine in that case? Was yeah, that, is, that, is that an expression of uh, Russian power? Yeah, very good example again. Mm. Uh, wonderful idea of, uh, from the point of view of industrialists, not to subsidize the, the competitor. We were subsidizing the people who were on, on the local competition on our market. But in the way it was negotiated and done and put down the throat of the Russian population was disgusting. So it was another propaganda flop with a good idea and a good intention at the beginning. Okay. Andre? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's rather hard to talk about subsidies when you're proposing uh, Ukraine to pay, f pay five times higher price than to the neighboring Belarus. So uh, that is why it looks like the price in Belarus now is closer, maybe even lower than in Russia today. So that is why, why we're paying uh, subsidies to uh, Belarus. And this um, use of energy for power, uh, is that uh, what's going on? Yes, and the answer is very clear, because it is what uh, economists call price discrimination. And price discrimination is based on political motivation, whom we like and who we do not. Not we, but the, the authorities. And if there is some kind of democratic government in Ukraine or Moldova or Georgia, actually, against all those three countries, 
the energy supply has been cut uh, uh, in the last three months. So that's, it's just attitude of authorities. You but uh, this uh, different approach to different uh, consumers. So that is why it is a very clear actual sign that actually we have not seen in the former Soviet Union times. Because during the former Soviet Union, we never cut energy supply to any country in the world. So th this is a novelty. And this is a novelty actually is a repetition of the so-called Saudi disease, using of energy as a weaponry yeah, against your political Andrew enemies or adversaries. Andrew, they and this is actually very dangerous because actually it is destroying the very basis of economy and politics in our country. And it is actually much more dangerous for us than for our consumers. I'm a taxpayer. <laughs> I'm a taxpayer. I paid for that gas. I paid, I paid for that oil. They were stealing from us uh, Ukrainians. They were not sign, signing up an agreement and stuff like that. So uh, again, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very lousy execution, say. but the idea was absolutely sane. Why should I subsidize with low cost gas uh, uh, Ukrainian metal, work, uh, metal works when they compete on, on my own market? So <laughs> I'm not subsidized all by right, my well, government. All right, uh, 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 could I interrupt you? Well, Grigori, the, the, the Ukraine, let's not just stick on the Ukraine question. The question, could I, could and I, it was, I, that's just an point. example, yes, but what the, about the, the, the using the energy to the, recreate the, a superpower? The, the initiative to, to, to put the market prices uh, to, to gas in, uh, uh, in relations between Russia and Ukraine was the initiative of the, of the Ukrainian pre president last March. And there was a lengthy negotiations. Unfortunately, they failed before the beginning of the new year. So that drama, which was probably not the most elegant uh, exercise, but it happened. And happily enough, within, within several days, uh, there was a fixed decision by Gazprom and, and the respective body in Ukraine. So we now have the, uh, 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 you know, the fixed, uh, uh, how should I say, fixed deal with Ukraine. But I can promise you that probably by, by the middle of this year or the end of this year, there will be the market prices to all of the country's consumers. And there will be no exclusions to that. And Belarus as well. See. Belarus is going to be paying full market price. Well, there will be a market price. I mean, there will be different, of course, because well, of the different di market prices. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because of the dip, because of the distance, and because of the, uh, and there can be different, the, the there can be different kind of repayment. Can be a tube or, or something. Okay. The, the man up there in the second row from the back. You, sir. Well, I just want to ask one curious question which from my point of view lies on the surface. Russia always tries to become a superpower to use its resources to influence other countries and the world as a whole, to influence foreign policy. But why it never uses anything to solve its problems in the country? Why we always try to influence the other world, to show them how they should live if okay. we can't solve our problems ourselves? Gary. <laughs> I think it's an excellent question, and we could see that all these uh, resources that have, that have been allocated for quite a while, and the Russian treasury is now full, and we have even Russian ministers complaining on television, on Russian television, that they didn't know how to spend the money. And at a time when, when most of the country is experiencing real economic hardship and the living standards are deteriorating outside of these uh, windows in Moscow or, or, uh, mm, or St. Petersburg. Now, so far, Russian, Russian oil reserves are pumping up uh, real estate prices in London. And I think it's very important to recognize that the, 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 the regime is using it for its own enrichment. And uh, I think it's we, while we're talking about oil, we should recognize that Yukos was destroyed and the uh, and two leading men there, uh, Khodorkovsky and Lebedev, were in jail for doing exactly what is still common practice of Russian companies. Isn't it, Mr. Yurgis? Yeah, well, selective, uh, selective jurisprudence, no question about that in ah, Yukos' okay, case. Okay. But, uh, Gary, I would take you on one thing. It's not the window of uh, sh or dressing window here in Moscow uh, or in St. Petersburg. For the last five years, and uh, Andrew would uh, confirm, the real incomes grew by 9%. That's the whole population uh, after it's inflation. It's correct. Average, average, is living a average little bit earnings better. in Moscow, yeah. $820 the, the, the a the month. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Average. Uh, 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 Douglas, come here a moment. Andre, you just want to pick up on that. Right. Uh, I would like to say that I'm against subsidies, Igor, as no. many people here. And actually, I was against subsidies uh, against Ukraine, Belarus, or anyone else when this discussion happened in Kremlin some time ago. Uh, but if we look what has happened after January 1st. Before January 1st, Gazprom was supplying gas to Ukraine. And Gazprom 
as a result of that, paid, price, uh, paid taxes to the Russian budget. Now, after January 1st, not Gazprom is supplying but gas to Ukraine. Ross Ukra something. Ross Ukra Energa, mm -hmm. the company that is actually registered in Canton Zug in Switzerland. And now, <laughs> and now not ga Gazprom. <laughs> Just a second. And now, it's most interesting, now Gazprom pay nothing in taxes to the Russian budget because it does not supply gas to, okay. uh, to Ukraine. Now, company Ross Ukrainerga does not pay taxes to Russian right. budget as well because it is uh, registered uh, in I Switzerland. I think the point is being so made. That yeah. is why now, if y before we pay some subsidies, if some people can claim to Ukraine and Belarus, today we're paying subsidies to Belarus and owners of Ross Ukrainerga. Yeah. So you okay. can, you can think but about the difference. Dr. Alexander, let me just restate the question. Is, I mean, we've heard a lot about the way that Russia has used its energy as a way of, uh, depending on your view, controlling or um, getting the market right or whatever, but is it a good basis for recreating superpower status? Is that what you think Russia is going to use its energy for, and is it a possible achievement? Well, it seems to me likely that as world energy demand rises, a country with extraordinary natural resources like Russia will both increase its wealth and, yes, probably its political power. Just to give you one example, about a quarter of Europe's gas at the moment comes from Russia. If present trends continue, by 2020, three quarters of Europe's gas will come from here in Russia. Now, President Putin tells the West that, unlike OPEC, he doesn't want to use energy supplies as a political weapon. But there is absolutely no doubt that the affair at the turn of the year mm -hmm. uh, in relation to Russian gas supplies to the Ukraine badly damaged confidence about the energy security of those Russian supplies. That's why I return to where we began this conversation. What's the most practical way that we can get the energy security, which certainly the West wants, and which Russia's political leaders tell us they want? That's why I think at the G8, certainly it's important that the event takes place. But what is more important is what is achieved. Will we see the kind of open, transparent markets which are the best guarantee of not just transparency of pricing in relation to particular countries, but more generally the energy security that undoubtedly okay. Europe wants to see? Uh, I come back to you, as I said I would, on the question of the use of energy for power. You've heard yeah, the criticisms first of all, first from, of all, from the British Minister about the way that yes. power has been used up to now. First of all, I should say that we are not after the superpower status. That should be clear. Not after uh, we, it. Not after it. Yeah. We, 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 we are satisfied with the status we, are, we have now, uh, uh, but we would like to, to, to become a, you know active economy with, with uh, uh, transparent practices. It's not so simple to, to achieve that. We are trying to do that. But, but what, what actually happens with gas, what we are trying to achieve is, is a transparent schemes of gas delivery to Europe and to our neighbors. We, we have certain problems, but we, we do hope that our colleagues and partners in the G8, in, in, the, in Europe, would understand the difficulties. You know, Europe is a bit more practical and uh, pragmatic. We are a little bit more emotional than Europe. So when we marry emotions and, and uh, practical approaches, I think we'll have the necessary achievement. Riguri, okay. are, you, are, you, are you calling uh, Rosukurenergo scheme as transparent scheme? I, well, I am not acquainted with people in Rosukurenergo. Yes, you've been scheme? silent a long time, just very briefly, about no. superpower status. No, briefly, because we're coming to the end of the program. Uh, we're certainly not after superpower status, but we want and I think we are entitled not to be mentored and tutored by the West anymore because even you as a virtuoso conductor of this scenario programmed it to put Russia on defensive position no, no, so no, that no, we can that, we no. only say oh Russia is no. not that bad the no best thing. thing I heard here okay. that we are still humans just give them another thousand years so bare skin will uh, <laughs> hide <laughs> out etc. All I would Russian say people David, David start David. detest oh. Patronize, you're patronizing them. And if right. I'm allowed to list our disappointments with the West, but I'm not allowed to do that. Well, uh, you, you would say if, we had more, if we had more time, another, you could. But what I would say is that all these questions came not from me, but from the audience. And I'm very grateful to them, and I'm very grateful to all of you who came here to take part in the program. Sadly, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, there isn't a question time next week. We're back three weeks from now, April the 20th, after Easter. We're going to be in Cambridge. On our panel in Cambridge, the Home Secretary Charles Clark, Oliver Letwin, Chairman of the Conservatives Policy Review. 
And on the 27th of April, we're going to be in Coventry. Now, if you'd like to come, you'd be very welcome to those programmes. 090 is the number to ring. Otherwise, go to our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash question time. You can comment on what's been said here tonight. There Tomorrow morning, you can read what others have said. From all of us here in Moscow, good night. <laughs>